Good afternoon. Welcome to the Aging and Long-Term Services Department webinar on the 2017 Severance Tax Bond Application Training as well as the Asset Management Training. My name is Rebecca Martinez and I am the ALTSD Capital Projects Bureau Chief. Our presenters today are Barbara Romero, who is the ALTSD Capital Projects Coordinator, and Heather Himmelberger, who is the Executive Director of the University of New Mexico Southwest Environmental Finance Center. At the bottom of the screen, you will see a web link to the uh, New Mexico Aging website, and this web, this web link will take you directly to all of the documents applicable to the 2017 uh, Capital Outlay Request application. Um, at the end of this presentation, you will find contact information for both Barbara Romero and myself, where you may either call us or email us with any additional questions you might have at the end of this presentation. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Barbara Romero, who will begin the presentation. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Today we're going to be talking about the 2017 severance tax bond application process through the Aging and Long-Term Services Department. Um, we have received word from our from the executive that this year, during 2017, we will only consider projects that are critical in nature. So that means they must address an urgent need or an emergency situation that would immediately endanger the occupants of the premises or would create a serious threat to the health and or safety of the citizens. Now those could be situations where immediate action is necessary, the situation would disrupt a senior center from operating, or failure is imminent if not corrected in a timely manner. The threat can be supported by a subject matter expert, which we'll explain a little bit later. The situation was not a direct cause of poor maintenance or neglect, and that the applicant took steps to prevent, alleviate, and or correct the situation, and resources were not available to correct the situation. For 2017, the funding source available will be Barbara, Severance Barbara, Tax Bond. Sorry to interrupt. Um, the attendees are still on hold for some reason. Um, I clicked the button, but it didn't go through. We're going to have to start from scratch. I apologize. Okay. But we do have 40 That's people. okay. Um, so, I um, saw that. <laughs> yeah, so if, can, you, can you go back to your first slide, and then I will... Yes. Uh, okay, let me see. I put from the beginning, resume... The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Aging and Long-Term Services Department webinar on the 2017 Severance Tax Bond application process. Uh, we will provide training on the asset management afternoon as well. My name is Rebecca Martinez, and I am the ALTSD Capital Projects Bureau Chief. Our presenters today are Barbara Romero, who is the ALTSD Capital Projects Staff Coordinator, and Heather Himmelberger, who is the Executive Director of the University of New Mexico Southwest Environmental Finance Center. I want to direct your attention to the bottom of the screen where you will see the New Mexico Aging web link where all the documents pertaining to the 2017 application can be found. Uh, at the end of this PowerPoint presentation, you will also see contact information for both Barbara Romero and myself. You may send us an email or give us a call if you have any questions whatsoever regarding this 2017 application process. With that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Barbara Romero, who will uh, begin the presentation. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you all for listening in on today's presentation or today's webinar. 
Today we're going to be talking about the 2017 severance tax bond application process. Um, the direction from our executive, who was the governor of the state of New Mexico, indicated that in 2017 we will only consider applications that are critical in nature. That means that we will only consider activities which address an urgent need or an emergency situation that immediately endangers the occupants of your facility or create a serious threat to the health and or safety of those citizens. That may mean situations which Im immediate action is necessary, the situation would disrupt a senior center from operating, or that failure is imminent if not corrected in a timely manner. The threat can be supported by a subject matter expert, which we'll go over a little bit later. That the situation was not a direct cause of poor maintenance or neglect, and that steps were taken to prevent, alleviate, and or correct the situation, and that there are no resources available to correct the situation. 2017 is a severance tax bond funding year. Severance tax bonds are a tax imposed by the state on the extraction of natural resources such as oil, coal, or gas. Now keep in mind that as we've seen this year, the gas prices fluctuate and we are at an all-time low for gas. That means that we don't have as many resources as we have in past years. So with that in mind, try to make sure that you supplement your request with other funding sources such as the Community Development Block Grant, which is administered through the Department of Finance and Administration, the Tribal Infrastructure Fund, administered through the New Mexico Finance Authority, the New Mexico Department of Transportation's 5310 program, and the New Mexico Finance Authority also has planning funds available to try and supplement some of your um, project needs. Um, we have revised the application and the forms that you'll be using today, so make sure that you go to our website and only utilize the forms that are available on that website. Now the application has been revised and is in line with critical need projects. That application is available on our ALTSD website. The link is directly below. It is in, it is in a fillable format. However, we have had some um, people contact us to indicate that in some cases, the field, once you start getting to the maximum size, it starts reducing the font size. So if you find yourself at, in that type of situation, Simply note that you are going to add an attachment and include that question on another attachment with your application. And we apologize for that. We, will, we do have our asset management inventory listings, which are all revised and available. The project evaluation form, which is a required document. We are including the link to the Infrastructure Capital Improvement Senior Facility Database. That database is administered through the New Mexico Department of Finance and Administration, and the contact person's name is Carmen Morin. Her phone number is there on that page. I believe that the Department of Finance and Administration is finalizing their training schedule. Um, they hope to go out regionally to, to show you how to input the data into this database in April and all the way through June. So make sure that you're looking for those dates um, we will also try and send out an email notification when we get the finalized um, schedule. We do have a transparent rating and ranking process. As you can see from our training dates for 2017, we are at the end of our training session. Today is our last training session and it's a, it is a webinar which will be made available online uh, at least by tomorrow morning so you can log in if you want to go back and recap some of the information that we talked about today. The deadline to submit the applications for the 2017 application is no later than Friday, April 8th at 5 p.m. Included in the package are the following forms. The application information and certification, a basic application, A1 code compliance or other renovation request form, a2 meals equipment or other equipment request form, A3 vehicle request form, and this year we've included an A4 plan and design request form. In addition to that, the required documents to be attached with your application will be the asset management form for vehicle inventory, facility and fixture inventory, as well as your meals and other equipment inventory. 
In addition to that, we have the new project evaluation form, the infrastructure capital improvement plan. You may just uh, send us a screenshot of what was submitted uh, online in that database, as well as the quotes or cost estimates for the proposed project. Again, this year's projects, we will only consider projects which are critical in nature. The proposed project must address a specific critical health, safety, welfare, risk or hazard issue and documented by a subject matter expert. The project must also eliminate a risk or hazard to public health and or address safety issues that immediately endanger occupants of the premises. And corrective action must be urgent and unavoidable. The application requirements are also uh, discussed in our guidance document at our website. I'll try not to go into these in too much detail. They're outlined in that guidance. But make sure that when you are submitting your application that you are answering all questions. Please do not leave any blanks. Um, if you're giving a not applicable response, provide the reason why it's not applicable. Detail all the pertinent information so as to the critical need or urgency of the project is evident. Include any details to document the efforts on the applicant's part made towards the project. This, in, this can include um, town hall meetings, public hearings, um, council meetings, um, things of that nature. Resolutions, anything you may have to show the efforts on the applicant's part to say that this is a critical need project. You must also be able to provide a detailed task list, milestones, the anticipated commencement date and end dates, um, so that we can justify in determining the critical need of the request. Now this replaces what we used to have, a scope of work. Um, we realize that the scope of work may not be um, taking place of what we really need to know, which is what is the project. I need to know square footage, what we're changing it to, if you are doing a renovation project, if you're replacing carpet with ceramic tile, those types of things. Please include square footage, um, things of that nature with your detailed uh, project listing. Also provide supporting documentation, such as the project evaluation form, your quotes, the bids, plans and specs, cost estimates, letters of support, ownership, and natural leverage documentation. Now before you begin, please keep in mind that the land or property for the facility should already be acquired and owned by the local government in order to be eligible to proceed with application for funding. Attach a copy of the lease or operating agreement. The asset inventory listings must be completed and submitted with the application. So that means at this point you should start looking at all of your capital assets and updating those listings. You must also include the infrastructure capital improvement plan and the project evaluation form. Now let's talk about the basic application, which is the beginning point for your application process. We've created this basic application so that we can gather important information about your facility, including the ownership of the facility, the condition of the facility, the operation and maintenance of your facility, as well as, as, well as staff used at the facility, including volunteer, um, like that, the types of services that are provided, the capital assets in your facility, the funding sources used to either construct or make improvements to the facility, documented repairs, the uses, the size, and the location, as well as any other information that would provide insight as to the current and future capital outlay needs of the facility. Now this is important because we use this if we haven't had the opportunity to go out and conduct a site assessment on your facility. It gives us insight and gives us a good idea of what's going on in your facility. Now make sure that when you talk about the condition of the facility, it should match the request that you're submitting. So if you tell me that your facility is in good condition, but yet you're submitting a critical need project, that might not be in line with this basic application. 
Now make sure that you complete one basic application per facility. In some cases, the county may have five facilities that they manage. And if you're submitting an application on behalf of each one of those five sites, you must submit one of these basic applications with each application. Now this is also a, a useful tool when you need to show up to a city council meeting, a commission meeting, and you have to present information with respect to that senior center. These three pages that talk about the basic application have lots of information that you'll be able to use for those types of meetings. It's also an, another important tool to submit to your legislators so that they can support the bills that we are support that we are submitting as an agency on behalf of the senior centers. So it's also a good tool for, for you as, as, as an administrator. You can also use that when you have a new director going to the senior center or new change in staff at your local government. Now there are four types of uh, categories that you can apply for during the 2017 application process. The first one is A1, code compliance or other renovation. The A2 form, I'll go into these in a little more detail in just a bit. The A2 form for your mills or other equipment. Your A3 form for vehicles. And the A form for plan and design. Again, code compliance and renovation. Code compliance is anything that includes protecting property values and the environment, complying with regulations such as land use and zoning ordinances, health and housing codes, uniform building and fire codes, and then complying with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now make sure that the, the code compliance project is detailed and fully identifies the specific issues that are being addressed. Also describe how the issue or the request must also describe how the issue was identified and how the renovation will address the issue. The request must include documentation in support of the request, such as letters from the state fire marshal, the environmental department, the Department of Health, Office of Environmental Health, or any other relevant oversight entities. Make sure that you do not include items related to the operation and maintenance of a facility, such as painting, door stops, things like that. In addition to that, A1 will be used for renovation projects, which means you're restoring a building to an earlier condition by repairing or remodeling. Projects for enlarging a facility or completing construction of a center estimated at less than $200,000. You can also submit during this cycle. Now keep in mind that renovations of privately owned facilities is prohibited by the New Mexico Constitution. Things to consider when you're submitting your application is, what is the need? Is it critical? And can you justify it? Is the facility sufficient in size for the people that attend the facility? Is it code compliant? Is the facility in such disrepair that renovation is the only way to go and does deem a critical need? Is the facility not functional for the needs of the seniors? Is it an urgent risk? to seniors? Is there a plan for operating and maintenance of the facility? And uh, Heather will talk about that a little bit later in her presentation on asset management. Do you have the support from the community and the governing body? And can you provide a detailed project description? Those are things that you should consider before you start submitting an application for the project. Now, these are just a couple of examples of items that we're looking for. If you can, in some way, show me through your application that it's a critical need, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to justify and submit a recommendation on behalf. Now, in addition to that, pictures do tell a thousand words. So if you do have pictures of the proposed project, please include those, those as part of your application. It really helps us gain a better understanding of that project itself. Now the second category that you can apply for is meals equipment or other equipment. Now meals equipment is machinery, apparatus, or components, and any other articles for use in preparing, cooking, and serving food. For other equipment, it's any other articles to make an action or operation or an activity easier or to serve a particular purpose. The equipment must have a useful life of at least 7 to 10 years and be valued at $5,000 or more. 
So we're going to talk about useful life a little bit more. In the past, we used to indicate that the useful life of a piece of equipment was 10 years. And the reason we have a 10 year, or we had 10 years in the past, was because these are bonds that the state pays on over a period of time. The period of time that it took for the state to pay off those bonds was approximately 10 years. So you see the $5,000 threshold? We include that $5,000 threshold because it doesn't make sense for the state to be spending or paying on a bond for 10 years for an item that's less than $5,000. So for that reason, we have the useful life, which is now 7 to 10 years because we've, we've been told that the state is now paying off the bonds in a shorter period of time, in 7 to 10 years, and the value is more than, it has to be more than $5,000. Um, make sure that you do not include consumables or supplies, um, things like pots, pans, utensils, trays, um, the film that covers the trays that go out for um, your home delivered meals, things of that nature. Those are items that you can pay for using your program funds. Again, things to consider when you're submitting an application under the category for meals equipment or other equipment is what is the need? Is that a critical need? And can you justify that need? Have you sought other funding sources first? Now, that means I, I, made, I gave a couple of examples of other places, the community development block grant programs, um, local sources you could use. Now we talk about program funds and can program funds be used to purchase this item. So we're going to talk about ways on where do these program funds come from. Now as you know, if a vehicle is purchased for the senior center, for use at the senior center, using funds through our agency, and that vehicle has met its useful life or no longer is needed at the center, if that vehicle is sent to auction or is sold in some manner, the funds derived from the sale of that piece of equipment now can go back and be used for your program. So make sure that you, if you have, have a vehicle that was sent through the auction process or was sold, that you are tracking those funds that are coming back and that those funds are being put back into the Senior Center program funds so that you can use those to pay for those smaller ticket items. Now is the equipment sufficient for the facility use? Does the equipment meet safety standards? And that's important to make sure that we have the best equipment and that it's safe for use, for daily use. Is the equipment in disrepair? Is the facility conducting routine maintenance? Now, if you are submitting your inventory listings for your equipment and we do not see that you're doing an annual maintenance on your equipment, we're going to have an issue with that because, as you remember, the only things that we can consider this year are things that were not a direct cause of poor maintenance. So make sure that you are conducting routine maintenance on those pieces of equipment. Now, is this an urgent risk to seniors? Is there a plan for repair and maintenance? And Heather will talk about that a little bit later in her asset management presentation. Will this new item enhance the services provided? Now, sometimes we try and bring more um, seniors to the facility so that they can use the facility and we can justify keeping those facilities open. One way that we've heard um, is a new item that they're, that they're bringing in is the installation of salad bars, hot and cold um, serving stations. And these seem to be pretty popular with some of the younger, gen with the younger crowd. And so we see this as an enhancement to the center. So those are the things that we might consider in the application process this year. Now, make sure you don't get to the, to the situation on the upper left-hand corner where your equipment was in such disrepair and it didn't meet safety standards and it burned. You can see the refrigerator on the right where it's just at capacity. So this just means that you don't have enough room for space and you're probably going to the grocery store two and three times a week, which is not efficient. And so if you purchase a larger refrigerator or a walk-in type refrigerator, you would get a better deal on foods because you can purchase in bulk, things like that. So these are just um, pictures to give you an idea of what we're looking for. We need to get this type of picture in our mind when you're responding to the question. 
The next category is your A3 form, which is the vehicle request form. And that is to purchase and equip vehicles for transporting people or goods, such as home delivered meals. Now make sure that at least 50% of the vehicles in your fleet are accessible for persons with disabilities. Now this excludes meal delivery vehicles. Now when we talk about making sure that we have, that it's accessible for persons with disabilities, simply means that if you have a person who needs assistance getting into a van and all they need is a grab bar, that we're only purchasing things like a grab bar. We don't necessarily have to have a wheelchair lift or a ramp if that's not what the, the um, persons that are attending your facility need. Um, if you just need a, a, a railing at the bottom so they can step up onto the next step into the van, those are the types of things that we're talking about when it needs to be accessible for persons with disabilities. All applications must identify the requested vehicle that is replaced, being replaced. Um, make sure that that asset management form is included. Make sure that the vehicles that you're requesting replacement of have over 100,000 miles or be more than 7 to 10 years old. Now, 100,000 miles is not the threshold number. It doesn't mean that if you've reached 100,000 miles, it's over. That vehicle has passed its useful life. If you're still getting, getting good mileage and it's still in good condition, well, not good, great condition because you're maintaining it properly, you can utilize those vehicles as long as you need to. Um, again, if it's more than 7 to 10 years old, then we'll look at replacing those types of vehicles, especially if they have extensive repairs. Now, you must be sure that you're documenting those extensive repairs on your vehicle inventory listing form so that we can go back and we can at least justify the need. So if you're not submitting that form, then there's no way for us to recommend this project for funding. Again, things to consider. What is the need? Is it critical? And can you justify the project or the request? Again, have you sought other funding sources first? Look again to the New Mexico Department of Transportation's 5310 program. We do have a, a, a grantee currently that is utilizing that, and they were able to get a good match for their project, and it allowed them to get a larger shuttle bus for use at their center. Now, if the vehicle is not operable or requires extensive repair, make sure you're including that information um, with your project and your application. Is the vehicle past the useful life of 7 to 10 years? Is the vehicle maintained properly according to warranty? And make sure that when you do have vehicles that you purchase through our office that you are following those manufacturer's warranty schedules for um, maintenance. Um, it's important that you try and keep up with those so that we can get the most useful life out of the, out of the project. Again, is this an urgent issue or a risk to seniors? Are there specific handicap requirements for the vehicle? Again, we talked about whether you need grab bars or railings as compared to a lift or a ramp. Is this a new vehicle? And can you justify the need? Now, especially with new vehicles that we're adding to stock, it's important that you're able to justify the reason why you need the new vehicle. It may be that you can justify it through the fact that you um, created a new delivery, a home delivery route. Now make sure that if you have a new route that you also have a driver for that route because we're not going to buy a vehicle that's not going to be used. So make sure that you include all of those types of information when you're submitting a request for a new vehicle. And again, will this new item enhance the services provided? Now in some cases, we have uh, vehicles that are being used for transportation However, the vehicles are either too high, too low. We need 4x4 four four type vehicles for the routes that they're um, using as far as transportation. So you have to be able to tell us those types of things. Um, if you're switching from a 5-passenger or 6-passenger bu bus to a 13 or 15-passenger shuttle bus, and why you need that, because it will cut down on your routes, um, the transportation um, is more efficient, and you don't have seniors sitting there waiting in your facility for long periods of time. 
Again, this is just a couple of examples on what we're trying to envision when we're reading through the application. The last category that you can apply for is the plan and design category. Now this is new and we felt that we had to create in its own form um, because it wouldn't be fair when we were doing the rating and ranking of the project because it didn't meet the exact same criteria as a project that's already in existence. So for that reason, we created a plan and design form which has um, questions that will rate uh, fairly across the board as a currently existing project. Now a plan, uh, a plan and design form is to be used for a plan, blueprint, or drawing made to scale to show the look and function or workings of a building or other object before it's made and all other steps incident to creating a plan for a final product. Um, we don't pay for feasibility studies. Those are things that you should have already taken into consideration when you were deciding to build a new facility. Um, so make sure that you understand that. No feasibility studies or any types of studies at all. Again, when we're submitting an application for a plan and design, um, the things to consider is what is the need for the new facility? Is it critical and can you justify that need? Now we talk about the need for a new facility. There's a lot of things that come into that. So if you remember going back to that basic application, we ask a lot of questions. One of the questions is, what is the current size of the facility? How many people attend the facility? What are the uses of the facility? And then we also ask the question on, where is the nearest location to you? Now we're going to be looking at all of those responses to those questions so that we can deem the, the criticality for this new facility. Um, so make sure that you're completing that basic application. You're adding a lot of information to it so that we can tie this back to this plan and design form. Now we want to know whether the plan will address code compliance issues. Um, so let's just say that you have a building maybe that was given to you at one point and it was an old building before they even had um, ADA compliance and everything in there would need to be retrofitted in order to, to comply with that. That is something that we would need to know, that it would cost more to renovate the facility than to create a new senior center. Is the plan for the new facility more cost effective? You're going to have to be able to tell us that. Let's just say, again, we have an old building that is not well insulated. You have single pane windows. You have, um, you know, a bad roof, things like that. You'd have to be able to tell us what is the current condition of the old facility and why the new facility would cost less to maintain and operate. Is the plan for the new facility feasible and realistic? And we talk about this a lot. We've seen um, applications come in in the multi-millions of dollars. And we have to be able to look at it and reasonably think whether or not the number of people that are going to be utilizing that facility and the cost to build that facility are feasible and realistic. So make sure that when you're looking at that, that we're not overbuilding. It's also important that when you're thinking about the new building that you're going to, to construct, that you have thought about the operation and maintenance costs for that new facility, and do you have enough budget for it? Now, if we're going from a 5,000 square foot building to a 20,000 square foot building, we have to think about the heating and cooling costs, the water, the gas, and the staff needed to maintain that facility and to operate that facility. So those are the things that you really have to take into consideration on whether or not a new facility is what's best for your location. So the next step um, in order to start the process is to go through and download the application from our website and you can host that on your own desktop. Again, there is our web address. Start now to complete the asset inventory listing. It's important that you start on those inventory listings because if you don't have those completed, there is absolutely no way you can start the initial process on whether or not this is a critical need or what your needs are. This is the only way for you to gather that information is once those inventory listings are completed. Contact a subject matter expert. In our website, you'll notice that there is a project evaluation form. Um, we are requesting that when you are considering a project, 
if it's a renovation project and you've had a contractor come in and say, yep, we need to replace this whole entire wall because you have separation, there's a foundation issue, all your windows need to be replaced, whatever the issue may be, that you're submitting that project evaluation form. And so in the case of this example that I just gave, the subject matter expert would be the contractor. Now in other instances, let's just say you have some uh, bathroom renovations that you need to, to make because you have uh, bad pipes, um, low water pressure, whatever the case may be. The plumber that comes to look at the project and provide you with a cost estimate will be the subject matter expert in this case. They will be the ones to fill out that project evaluation form. In the case of a roof, it'll be a roofer, so on and so forth. If you do have internal staff, maybe you're fortunate enough to have an architect or engineer on staff, those will be the subject matter experts in providing information regarding the project and the criticality of the need. Those are the persons that will complete that project evaluation form. Again, make sure that you start to gather your quotes and cost estimates for the project. And keep in mind that when you're submitting costing, the cost estimates and the quotes, that these funds aren't going to be available until 2017, and that's around May or June of 2017. So the quotes and the cost estimates that you're currently gathering more than likely will not be the same as in 2017. So what we ask that you do is you provide a 10% contingency fee on top of that to try and catch up with the us being behind the times and appropriating the funds. So ensure that to ensure that we have enough money to carry out the project. You can start setting up a project team, um, set up meetings, and try and divide up all the tasks. Again, one of the tasks, first of all, is to start working on those inventory listings. You can have several people working on those individual listings at this point. You can have one person contacting uh, people to get either cost estimates to come and look at the facility, or you can start looking online for quotes um, using the statewide price agreement as well. They can look at those that are currently available. Um, you can also start having them type in the application. And once you finish up all of those tasks, you can sort them around through each one of those members and see if they make sense. Um, when you're filling out the application, I want you to do one thing. Um, is I want you to go back to the guidance form that we have available online. And on the back page, we have a rating and ranking um, listing. On there, there is an available 105 points for each project. In that rating and ranking listing, we actually list the question and the point value for each of those questions. So when you're reading through that application, make sure that you have that rating and ranking um, form right in front of you, and that when you're responding to the questions we're asking, that they are, they have enough information. And if not, then you can start working on beefing up those, those questions or those responses to those questions. Um, there, are five, there are five categories, I believe, that we're looking at. The criticality of the need, the cost benefit, um, the uh, shovel readiness of the project. And the last one, I believe, on that form is the um, project management. Now, this is the first year that we're looking at the past performance of, of projects that have been awarded in, in previous years. So if you notice, that's a point value of approximately 20 points. So one of the things that you need to make sure is that the administrators um, in, your, in your local government are reporting into the capital projects monitoring system, that they are also submitting paper reports to the Aging and Long-Term Services Department, that they are submitting requests for reimbursement timely, and that we're adhering to the spend down um, process. So make sure that you look through all of these and make sure that you're answering these questions in detail. Now again, you have time to meet with council or committee members to discuss the needs of your project. You can use that basic application as a, as a segue into a meeting. And then at the final end, you'll have to determine whether or not this project 
is critical or if it can wait until the 2018 GEO bond um, funding cycle. Again, I talked about the project prioritization system. The criticality of need for the project is up to 30 points. Um, funding can garner you 15 points. Readiness to proceed or shovel-ready projects, 15 points. Project oversight, so this means that you have somebody who's dedicated to the project and ensures that the uh, project is on schedule and will meet the deadlines. Cost benefit is 10 points. And the last one I talked about was project management, which gets you 20 points. The total point valuation is 105 points. Now with this year's process, in the past we used to, there was still a little subjectivity in our rating and ranking process, where we had a panel of reviewers and raters. And in one case, one reviewer will look at the question and they'll say, well, I think they answered the, the question properly, so they'll give you the total five-point value. Whereas another one would think, no, they didn't, get, they didn't answer it in full detail, so I'm only going to give them two points. Well, that created a situation where there was still subjectivity as part of the rating and ranking process. So for this year, it is an all or nothing. Either you answer the question in detail and you get the full five points, or you didn't fully answer the question and you get zero points. So make sure you keep that in mind. We want you to make sure that you're getting the, num the, the maximum points available so that you're putting forth a very good application and that the rating is high. Now again, Rebecca and myself, these are our contact information. Um, you can reach us either by email or phone. Um, email is best so that we can try and submit a response to you timely. And we'll try and get to these questions as soon as possible. If you haven't heard from us in two or three days, simply just send us another email reminding us that you sent a question you need that responded to. Um, Rebecca and I are the only two persons that administer over 500 projects for the agency. And so we get kind of backed up sometimes, so I apologize for that. Again, this webinar will be posted to the, to the web link. Um, and I would check for that maybe tomorrow um, to see if it's been uploaded. Um, again, I'm going to make note of a chat box on the left-hand side. If you have any questions, um, type those in, and we can try and respond to you, to you at the end of the webinar. Um, and if you have no further questions or if you have no other um, things to talk about, we will go ahead and turn this over to Heather Himmelberger, who is again the Executive Director with the University of New Mexico Environmental Finance Center, and she's going to be presenting the piece on asset management. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just a second here, and we'll show my screen, and we'll start talking about uh, one of my favorite subjects, which is asset management. All right. We're going to start with just a quick review of what asset management is, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page of what we're talking about. And then what we're going to focus on today is operation and maintenance. Um, Barbara talked a lot about how it's important to keep up your facilities, because the state doesn't want to pay to provide new facilities if you haven't kept up the facilities that you already have. So if you have a senior center, a senior facility, you have many assets. And it's going to cost you money to construct, replace, operate, and maintain those assets. And most likely, if you're like most uh, public bodies, you do not have all the money you need to do all the things that you would like to do. So you're going to have to make choices about how and where to spend your money. And asset management is a program designed to help determine how you do that. There are five core components to asset management. And the first core component is the current state of the assets. The second is level of service. The third is criticality. The fourth is life cycle costing. And the fifth is funding. And I can best sum that up by saying you want to know what facilities you have because you can't manage what you don't know. You want to know what you want those assets to do because you can't manage if you don't know what you're trying to manage it to do. You need to know which pieces are critical to sustaining that performance that you want. You want to know how to operate, maintain, repair, and replace the infrastructure. And then finally, you want to know how to fund it. So that's 
in very simple terms what asset management is all about. If we dig a little deeper into the current state of the assets, what we're talking about is determining the assets that you own. So what are those physical things that make up your system? And there's a couple of pictures there of tables and chairs and vehicles and parking lots. So it's all that stuff, the buildings, um, the equipment inside, the kitchen, all those kinds of things are the assets that you own. You want to determine the asset's condition. So you can give it a rating of excellent, good, fair, poor. You can give it a numeric rating, say 1 to 5 or 1 to 10. And you want to just be able to assess what kind of shape that equipment is in. Uh, and Barbara previously showed some pictures of varying states of assets where some that were in very poor condition, some that were in better condition. You really want to understand the condition of your assets because that's going to play later on in replacement decisions and maintenance decisions. You want to estimate the remaining useful life of the assets, so how much longer will those assets remain in service? Do they have a short life, just a couple of years or so? Do they have a very long life, maybe 20, 30, 40 years from now? And you want to know the useful life in your facility using it your way. So it doesn't really matter if a senior center down the road said that their kitchen equipment is going to last 10 years, if yours only lasts five years in your application because of how you use it and that sort of thing, you want to know the, es the estimate of useful life for your particular applications and your use of those assets. We also want to estimate the replacement value of our assets. So for example, if you need a new oven, <clears throat> perhaps you can get an estimate that the new oven is going to cost you $5,000. You might ask, where could you get estimates of that type? One way is from the old CO Form 1. This was a form that was available um, through the ALTSD, and it had click clickable fields where you could click on the item, and it would bring up pictures as well as information online. You can still use those forms to get an estimate of what some of the kitchen equipment and that type of thing might cost to replace. There's also lots of information on the internet. You can do searches to find information of what a typical stove or refrigerator or whatnot would go for. You can use past experience. If you have experience purchasing these facilities at other places or other facilities, and you can use other person's experience. So another facility, another peer institution that may have purchased equipment, you can ask them what they had to pay. This particular estimate is not the estimate that you will provide for your most, uh, uh, for your current proposed project to the AL ALTSD. Rather, this is what you would estimate for equipment in your asset inventory. So the estimates don't have to be perfect. They just need to be order of ma magnitude and kind of a general idea of what the equipment would cost. So once we know how long the equipment is going to last and um, what it would cost to replace, it can help us determine what kind of money we're going to need one year, five years, ten years down the road. We want to develop an asset inventory based off that information of what we own, uh, what condition it's in, how much longer it's going to last, what its replacement value is. We want to develop an asset inventory. And here's where you can use the forms that ALTSD has on its website. There are forms available for that asset inventory. You can click on them, download them from the ALTSD website at the link that Rebecca gave at the beginning of the presentation. So please feel free to make use of those, but you can also make use of any other kinds of asset inventory forms. You can use generic spreadsheets or databases. There are lots and lots of commercial products out there. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can develop an asset inventory. One thing I would like to make mention of is we want to give equipment ID numbers to our equipment so that we can um, um, so that we can keep track of the various equipment and um, each each asset will have its own equipment ID number. And the other th issue is which assets belong in your asset inventory. We want to have most of the assets in there, but we don't want to go to such a level that you're tracking every fork or knife in your facility. So there is a limit at which we don't really need to worry anymore. Some things become more like a supply, like say a stapler or paper clip holder or something like that. We don't want to be tracking that kind of information in inventory. So we typically set a dollar figure and we say below that amount, we're not going to worry about it.
And that dollar figure might be uh, three or four or five hundred dollars depending on your facility or it may be a little higher or lower depending if your facility is bigger that number might be higher if it's smaller that number might be lower. When we're collecting asset data we want to take pictures of our assets and this is a really valuable thing to do so take a picture of the asset Take a picture of the pertinent information such as serial numbers, model numbers, electric usage, the tags that come with the equipment because invariably those tags are going to be on the back or the bottom of the piece of equipment and it's going to be very hard to get that information later. They also tend to get scratched, corroded, lost, bent up, etc. So it's a really good idea to have a picture of that information so that you can have that at your fingertips should you need it in the future. And also take a picture of any ID number tags that you have on the equipment so that all of that is together. So you have the equipment, the ID number, and all the pertinent information uh, from the tags on the equipment. And you should store this information so that you can have it for your asset inventory, you can have it to look at condition over time, and also as a side benefit, you can use this if you ever get into an emergency situation where you have a fire or a flood or something of that nature. This will give you information to help you recreate what was in your facility. You can provide it to an insurance company or um, an emergency management program that might want this information. And it's very, very useful to have. One tip, though, please make sure that you, you keep at least one copy of these pictures and inventory information off-site or save it in the cloud or something like that because if it's only stored on a computer at your facility, the fire or the flood might also damage your asset inventory information. The second component is the level of service. So this is where we get into the idea that senior facilities are in the customer service business and what you're about is trying to decide what service you want to provide for those customers that use your facilities. So we're talking about setting goals for what we want our facility to do and what setting goals for how we're going to operate that facility. When we set goals, we use an acronym called SMART. We want the goals to be very specific. We want to be able to measure them. We want them to be attainable. We want them to be relevant and time-bound. So, for example, a specific goal is something like, I'm going to provide 200 meals a day, Monday through Friday, from 11 to 1. That's very specific. I know exactly what I'm trying to do. It's also very measurable. I could count the number of meals I served. I could check the hours that I was in operation, and I could see if I'm meeting that goal. It could be attainable if my facility is capable of providing that many meals. It may not be attainable if my facility is only capable of, capable of serving 50 people or 100 people, in which case I would have to reduce my goal so that it would be attainable for my facility. Whether the goal is relevant or not depends on what you're trying to do for your facility. So if you set a goal, for example, that was related to having dances every Friday night at your facility, but that's not what your customers or your seniors visiting your facility wanted, that goal wouldn't be relevant to you because it wasn't the right kind of activity. And finally, we want it to be time-bound, like the goal I mentioned at the beginning where I said we'll serve meals Monday through Friday from 11 to 2. <clears throat> that goal is time-bound by the days of the week, Monday through Friday, and the hours of the day, 11 to 1. You have to think about how writing down goals can change your operation and management because it has a huge impact. When the goals are just sort of implied, we don't have the same kinds of conversations related to missing those goals and what we should do about it. So when you actually write down all the goals of your facility, you measure whether you met them or not, you can periodically review what your progress towards meeting those goals is, and if you're not meeting those goals, have that very serious conversation of what can I do about it? How can I improve my ability to meet the goals? Do I need more staff? Do I need different equipment? Do I need more vehicles? You know, what would improve my ability to uh, provide those services and meet, re reach those goals? Your goals are not set in stone. They can be changed, added or removed, or adjusted over time. So if a goal no longer fits your facility 
or for some reason you can no longer provide that service, you can adjust it, you can change it, you can do whatever you need to do. The third car component is criticality. And this is where we get into the fact that not all the assets in your facility are equally important. Some assets are going to be way more important to providing the services than others. So how do we determine criticality? The first question we ask is what is the likelihood or probability that an asset will fail? And what is the consequence if it does? So will it happen? And if it does, will it be a big problem? You can look at the chart that's on the screen now, and if we think about probability of failure increasing on the bottom axis and consequence of failure increasing on the left-hand axis, we can create a, a visual representation of the fact that any asset that's in this upper right-hand box is a high-risk asset, meaning it's very likely to fail, and the consequences if it does fail are very severe. Anything in the bottom left-hand box is going to be assets that have a very low likelihood that they will fail, and if they do, we really don't care anyway. And these assets are likely to fail, but the consequences aren't that severe. The assets in this box are not likely to fail, but if they would, the, the consequences would be pretty grave. The reason you do this is because this is how you want to operate, maintain, and fund your facility. Because if you can't do everything you want to do, you want to focus your money on the high-risk stuff or those assets that are in the upper right-hand box. That will help you have a lot be better bang for your buck. So if you focus spending time resources on higher risk assets, you'll reduce the overall risk of the facility for the same amount of money. When we calculate criticality, we multiply our probability of failure rating times the consequence of failure rating to get the criticality. So we will give all of our assets a ranking, say, from 1 to 5 of how likely they are to fail, with 1 being very unlikely, 5 being very likely. The consequence, again, 1 to 5, with 1 being a low consequence, 5 being very high. So as you go through each asset, if you gave it, say, a 2 probability of failure and a 3 consequence, the overall criticality would be a 6. And you do that for all of your assets so that you can rank your assets in terms of risk and see which ones fall in each of the boxes. Criticality is not static. It's going to change. Every day it's going to change slightly as you move from uh, using your assets and your assets are getting used up. The criticality is going to change. So we need to reassess criticality at least every year, if not sooner. We also want to reassess when major changes are being made upgrades, replacement, construction, rehabilitation, etc., because that will change our criticality also. So if you have a major facility change of some kind, you would want to go back and assess your criticality. The fourth part is life cycle costing. And this is where we get into the fact that assets have to be operated and maintained on a daily basis, and then when they're used up or reach the end of their useful life, we have to replace or rehabilitate them. So the maintenance is going to be the focus after we're through this introductory piece. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it now, but just understand that there's three types of maintenance that we'll do on our assets, routine, preventative, and predictive. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit. So when we get to the point where we have to replace an asset or it has broken, we can either repair it to bring it back into operation we can rehabilitate it or we can replace it. So rehabilitation would be something like sanding old hardwood floors to be able to still use them, or maybe re-roofing, uh, putting some new shingles on the roof. Something where we're not going to replace the whole thing, but we're going to rehabilitate it and bring it back to a usable um, level. And replacement, of course, is when we just get rid of the whole asset and replace it with a new one. Life cycle costing is really about balancing that O&M repair side against the replacement side. So replacements tend to be the more expensive option. So we want to try to stick to the left-hand side doing O&M and repair and rehab to keep from having to replace things as much as possible. So the operation and maintenance is really what we're going to do to try to keep our facility lasting longer and shorten uh, the number of times that we have to replace something, lengthen how long our assets last. Um, so that's kind of what our focus in life cycle costing is, really reducing our overall operational costs. 
part of the process of um, capital replacement is to prioritize your, your assets for replacement. And typically you'll, typically you'll do this through a capital improvement planning process, which is really part of the ALTSD capital outlay process. You're really trying to come to them with that prioritized list of what you need to run your facility. The final core component is funding. So when we get into funding, we, we have to realize that there are day-to-day -day expenses related to operation and maintenance as well as capital expenditures related to our long-term expenses. The reason we split them into two categories is because there's different funding sources depending on the needs. So the operation and maintenance have to come from some kind of community funding or fees or taxes, user charges, that sort of thing. And then the capital expenditures are going to come from outside sources potentially like the ALTSD capital outlay process, that's where you can get money to help you build those facilities. It's really about the story and how we tell it. So this is the story you would tell for why you need the facilities. And this is not story in a bad way, but story in a good way. Why do I need the funding? What is the risk if I don't spend the money? What is the benefit if I do? And you want to be honest and straightforward and explain exactly how you would need the how you would use the money, why you need it, what the benefits are in very specific terms so that you can paint a picture for ALTSD or any other funding source of exactly what you're trying to do so that everybody is clear on where you're going and you want to get there. The focus of the rest of the presentation today is really going to be operation and maintenance. So, a question. If there were no chance of failure whatsoever, would we do any maintenance at all on our assets? And the answer is no, we would not, because the reason we do maintenance is really to prevent failures. So what kind of failures are we trying to prevent? Well, we don't want our assets to fail completely, so we don't want them to break down, um, you know, our refrigerator stop functioning, our our dishwasher to stop washing dishes. We don't want that complete failure. We don't want disruption of service to our customers or any health or sanitation violations. We don't want to lose our ability to meet the Americans with Disability Act. Uh, we don't want a reduction in level of service. We don't want failures of one asset to cause a failure of another one. So we're trying to prevent all kinds of failures. And you might even think of some other kinds of failures that you're trying to prevent by doing maintenance. So the benefits or maintenance are very well known and very well documented. It's typically three to four times more expensive to operate a facility without proper maintenance. But unfortunately, the truth is that maintenance is a common item that people cut from the budget. And why is that? Well, one of the reasons is it seems to have limited impact in the short term because what we do today in reducing maintenance isn't going to show up until tomorrow, um, which could be one year, two year, three years, four years down the road. So the cause and effect are sort of separated. So sometimes people don't understand the maintenance that we fail to do today is going to cause us a problem down the road. So we really want to address maintenance and keep make the case for keeping that in your budget because that's how you're going to keep your facilities operating well and doing it well into the future and keeping the overall cost of your operation down. So we really want to fight that tendency to want to always find money uh, by taking it out of the maintenance budget. And it's always kind of interesting how people are very unwilling to pay for maintenance, but somehow when the emergency occurs because you didn't do maintenance, they can find three or four times as much money to make the repair as what it would have taken to do the maintenance. So again, we have to really fight hard the tendency for people to want to cut maintenance from the budget. So when you think about the maintenance of your facilities, how does that make you feel? What do you feel about the maintenance? Do you feel like you're doing a good job, a bad job? Could you do more? And an interesting question that I've uh, heard posited about maintenance is if an airplane was maintained the way you maintain your facility, would you fly in it? So think about that question and think about your facility and are you maintaining it in such a way that you feel confident that you're not going to have any issues with causing health or safety or 
any other kinds of concerns to the people using your facility or that you won't have to disrupt services because an asset failed and you couldn't provide meals or you couldn't deliver meals. So really think hard about how the maintenance in your facility is being done and is it adequate. So if you think back to the asset inventories that we were doing, um, that's going to provide a great starting point regarding the assets in our facility that need operation and maintenance. We can separate those assets into categories or classes. For example, buildings as a class, vehicles, uh, landscaping and parking lots, dining facilities and equipment, kitchen equipment. So there's different categories. And we want to do this because the operation and maintenance stuff that you will do will be very different in a vehicle versus kitchen equipment. So that's going to help us start to categorize our asset um, our operation and maintenance activities by putting our assets in these categories. So we can determine our O&M activities by each of these categories and then we could look specifically within the category and say maybe this vehicle needs different maintenance than that vehicle or this piece of kitchen equipment might need slightly different uh, maintenance than another one. But starting by category first will give you a good starting point for how to develop your O&M plan. The types of maintenance you can do, again, are routine, predictive, and preventative. So routine maintenance is that regular stuff you do every day to keep your equipment in operational working order. So it's the cleaning, the oiling, lubricating, um, just that day-to-day -day stuff you have to do to keep things running. The preventative maintenance are the kinds of things you do if something is starting to break down, starting to crack, starting to go bad you start to intervene at that point so it doesn't get worse. So for example, if you had a small hole in your roof, if you leave that go, it could become a big hole and then it might damage walls and flooring and other kinds of equipment. So we don't want that to happen. So we want to intervene while it's still a very small hole. We can patch it and keep anything bad from happening. So we're always looking to see if we, we start to see something going bad, maybe a motor that's starting to make a lot of noise, or, for example, on your car, if you hear that squeal that tells you that your brakes are starting to wear, you want to intervene at that point before the situation gets to the point of failure. The last type of maintenance is predictive maintenance. This is where we're going to try to go in and predict how much longer the asset is going to last in service. So we're only going to use predictive maintenance on those items that are extremely important to us and for which we really can't have it go bad. You might do this on a vehicle where you take it to a, a, a repair shop and you say, can you look over this entire vehicle, give it a complete tune-up, look and see how it's wearing, uh, and give me some estimate of how much longer I can drive it. You might have somebody come in and inspect your roof and give you some information about you know, how much longer that roof is going to last. So it's going to be big, important items that you might use this for if you have a walk-in freezer, for example, or refrigerator that's very expensive and very important to your operation, you might do it for something like that. We would not use this on something like tables or chairs or your common assets of that type. So we want to list our operation and maintenance activities by time and frequency. So what type of activities are we going to do? When are we going to do them? Is it monthly, weekly, daily? So that we can have some idea of what has to be done on our equipment. Here's a couple of examples, a commercial oven and a commercial refrigerator freezer. So if you looked at daily tasks that you might do on the oven, we might clean the oven interior. We might remove crumbs at the bottom of the oven, remove and clean the oven racks, etc. So there are certain activities that we would do every day on that oven. And then there's some activities we might do weekly. And then there's some activities we might do monthly, like performing a deep cleaning and a visual inspection. And we make some activities we do quarterly, like checking the door hinges, checking the oven seal, uh, checking for the temperature for accuracy. Um, for the refrigerator, maybe we have weekly activities, like cleaning out the old foods from our refrigerator. Uh, monthly ones like washing the outside of the unit and the interior. Semi-annually we might brush or vacuum the lint or dirt from the condenser. 
And then there's some activities we may do just as needed um, and not perform them until such time as we had to. Um, there's some activities on the screen now that refer to installation and operational tasks. So we can have this whole laundry list of activities we could do, and we can go through this for every piece of equipment we have in our kitchen, and then for the other assets we have, our um, buildings, our uh, vehicles, and we can start to make a listing of the operational and maintenance tasks that we would have to do for each item we have in our facilities. And then we would have this master list that lists daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly tasks for all of the assets so that we would know what it is we're supposed to be doing um, in terms of maintenance for our entire facility. We could make any adjustments to those tasks based on the useful life remaining of facilities. And this can happen in two ways. The first way is if the useful life is nearing the end, so the asset is scheduled for replacement, maybe you've already submitted a request to Capital Outlay, you've been funded, the project is in process, and within six months you expect to have a new oven installed. Well, we're not going to do major maintenance to that oven if we're going to replace it in six months. We're just going to do ab only what's absolutely necessary to keep it running for the next six months. We're not going to do anything else. So you would go through each of your assets that are nearing the end of their useful life and try to ensure that you're only doing what's absolutely necessary if it's going to be replaced. On the other hand, if you have to keep that asset in place longer, perhaps you submitted an application but it didn't get funded and it's going to be a couple more years before you have the money to do the project, you might have to increase your operation and maintenance to extend the useful life beyond that original estimate. So maybe you have to do some extra things to try to keep it running for two or three or four more years. So you can go either way depending on the useful life of your asset. You're going to want to have goals for your O&M program similar to having goals for the overall facility. But the types of goals would be a little bit different compared to the kinds of goals we had for overall facility. So some examples of the kinds of goals you might set are ratio of planned maintenance to corrective maintenance. We want to do more planned activities than corrective activities. We would like to have a balance of about 70 to 75 percent planned activities and maybe 25 uh, to 30 percent uh, corrective. Most facilities are exactly the opposite, where most of the activities are corrective, you're reacting to problems, and very little planned, so you want to swap that. Um, you might want to set goals about increasing the life of particular assets or classes of assets, so what kind of activities can you do, and try to keep maybe your vehicles in place longer. So maybe you set a goal that you would like each of your vehicles to last at least 10 years in operation. You might have decrease in costs related to contracted repairs. So if you have to call a repairman in to come to your facility and make a repair to your dishwasher, your oven, your refrigerator, that's going to cost you a lot of money. So the fewer times they come to your facility, the more money you're going to save. So you could set a goal related to maybe you try to reduce your contracted repairs by 5% uh, or 10% or something of that nature. And then finally, decrease in cost of corrective maintenance over time. So what is that cost of all the repairs you do to your facility? Um, and can you decrease that a little over time by doing more maintenance? You want to develop a budget for the O&M that you need to do. So considering all the labor costs, the supplies you need, the equipment, your contractor, outside professionals that you might need, what would that total budget for O&M if you could do the O&M the way you wanted to do it, the types of activities you wanted to do, what would that total budget look like? And then you start to compare what are, what's the amount of money I have for my operation and maintenance and how does that compare to what I would like to have? So what is the gap between those two and how large is that gap? How do we fill in that gap? Well, we have to ask ourselves a couple of questions. Can we move any funding from other portions of the budget to O&M? Is there anywhere 
that we have maybe some extra funding or something that we could move from one place to another? Is there any way to get additional funding from other sources? Can we increase fees? Um, any of that kind of thing? And then finally, is there any way to cut costs? Because if we could cut costs, maybe that savings could be rolled into our maintenance program. One cost-cutting measure to think about is energy efficiency. So if we increase the energy efficiency of our operations and our building, and we reduce the cost of the energy, can we then roll that cost into the maintenance budget? So just looking at a couple of examples, um, the commercial refrigerator freezer, what are some things that we can do to increase the energy efficiency of refrigerators? We can reduce the number of times that the door is opened. We can close the door as quickly as possible after getting our items. We can clean the coils on the back or bottom of the unit. We can adjust the temperature control setting to a slightly warmer setting as long as we're not violating any standards re regarding uh, the temperature the refrigerator has to be set at. So with that caveat, we might be able to set it up just slightly higher as long as we're not causing any issues with um, regulatory requirements for the temperature. Uh, not putting hot foods into the unit until they cool down a little bit. And then I thought an interesting one was keeping the unit away from heat sources or direct sunlight. So we don't want to have our refrigerator right near a big picture window where the sun is going to really cause a lot of heat on the refrigerator and make it work that much harder to cool the food. There's also some things we can do for buildings, such as turning off lights, replacing light bulbs, sealing windows, etc. So there's ways that we can save energy within our buildings. So we want to see if savings on the energy um, can actually be spent in other areas, such as our routine maintenance program, preventative or predictive maintenance. So you'd want to really track those energy saving costs so that you can roll that money back into the budget. And you want to make sure that you are really looking hard at what was the energy used before and what is the energy used now and that saving so that you can take credit for it and have it for your maintenance budget. You want to develop an operation and maintenance plan that includes all of the equipment that needs to be maintained with its ID number so you can tie it back to your asset inventory. You want that plan to include all the activities that you're going to do so all those things that you're trying to accomplish within your facility for each of the assets, the time frame under which you're going to do them, so which are the things you're going to do daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, etc. You want the whole budget to be in there as well, so what is that budget going to be for your maintenance on a monthly basis, annual basis, and then you want to tie it to the equipment manufacturer's information and manuals. You want to check and see what those equipment manufacturers are telling you is the right type of maintenance and schedule of maintenance to do, but just keep in mind you want to take it with a grain of salt because there may be times where they're causing you to over, um, over maintain some of your assets. Maybe they're asking you to do something a little bit more frequently than you feel is warranted. So you can adjust a little bit from what the owners or the um, the manufacturers are telling you um, to best fit your knowledge of the situation. You want to be able to create a checklist of all the tasks that need to be done and when they need to be done to be able to keep records of re regarding whether you've completed these tasks or not. So have you done your monthly maintenance on your vehicles? Have you done your quarterly inspection of the roof, etc.? You would be able to check it off. This can be on paper or on computer um, or you can buy a commercial program that can help you with this. There's lots of different ways to do it. But certainly um, putting it on paper is fine if that works for you or you know, if you want to have it on a computer, that's okay also. You want to track project progress towards meeting your goals with the O&M program. So how are the goals going? You know, when you've been able to do more maintenance, have you been able to meet the goals in a better way? Um, if you're not able to meet the goals, what are the things that are keeping you from meeting the goals? Um, so you really want to look at that and adjust and maintain that um, O&M uh, program as best you can. And finally, we really want to keep good records of the operation and maintenance that we're doing on our facilities. 
Um, I think it's really, really valuable to have pictures, videos, notes, etc., of maintenance that you're doing. If there's very specific types of maintenance that might be more difficult than what you first anticipated, having a video that could tell somebody else how to do it would be very, very valuable to you. So find a way to keep that information within the computer or however you need to keep it um, uh, to best share it with others. And with that, I'll just put my contact information up there and just close out by saying that maintaining your facilities is really an important part of the whole process. So if the capital outlay funds, which are public funds from the state of New Mexico, if that money is given to your facility, you really want to do the best job possible taking care of the facilities and you really want to be good stewards of the assets that you're given. Um, so maintenance is one of the best ways to do that. So with that, I'll turn that back over to Rebecca to see if she has any closing, close, closing thoughts to close out our webinar today. Again, this is Rebecca Martinez with the Aging and Long-Term Services Department. Uh, on the screen, once again, you can see my contact information as well as the contact information for Barbara Romero. Um, this webinar will be posted to the ALTSD web link for the capital outlay documents, um, hopefully within about 24 hours. And please don't hesitate to give us a call or email. I want to thank Heather Himmelberger for participating in today's uh, presentation and Barbara Romero. Thank you, ladies. Um, once again, I appreciate you all joining us on this webinar and have a pleasant day. Thank you.